A functional behavior assessment is designed to help you arrive at an understanding of a student's problem behavior in order to develop a behavioral intervention plan. In fact, of the four steps utilized to help reduce problematic student behavior, functional behavior assessment, behavior intervention plan, data tracking, and objective modification based on data, it could be argued that a well-written functional assessment is the most important component in an effective plan. We must have an idea of what is driving a student behavior or what function the behavior is serving in order to apply specific interventions related to that function. For example, interventions utilized for problematic behavior in which the function is to escape or avoid a situation would be different than interventions utilized for a problematic behavior whose function is to gain adult attention. It should also be noted that this assessment is intended for students with intensive behavioral needs or Tier 3 students within an RTI model. If you have many students in your building at this level, you will want to consider strengthening your universal and targeted behavior supports. So if a functional assessment is so important, what does it look like and how should I fill one out? First of all, the most current functional behavior assessment forms can always be located on the St. Clair County RESA website. Once you are on the Response to Intervention page, click on Positive Behavior Supports and then Tier 3 Tools. There you will find the most current form and how-to video for the functional behavior assessment. Once you open the functional behavior assessment, you may notice that the form is divided up into eight different sections. Identifying student information and sources of data, describing the problem behavior, triggers and antecedents, consequences, current plan and strategies, student input, other, and summary or hypothesis statement. Let's start with our first section, identifying student information and sources of data. You will want to enter the student's name, date of the functional assessment, and who completed or facilitated the FBA. You will also want to record the sources of data that you are using during the assessment to help define a specific target behavior. Data should minimally include a review of the student's record and a scatter plot or other tool designed to provide a quantitative representation of the problem behavior. In other words, just how many times did this behavior occur over the time in question? Examples of other data that may be used during this assessment includes ABC logs, observations, and student office referrals. It is also a good idea to record who reported this information, such as teachers, parents, students, or others, such as school social workers or parapros. The second section, describing the problem behavior, is very important. In this section, we want to describe a specific, measurable, and observable behavior. We want to stay away from vague terms. For example, instead of saying non-compliant, you would describe the behavior, walks quickly or runs out of the classroom. Instead of saying refuses to work, you would describe the behavior, crawls under his desk. These terms are specific, measurable, and observable. Oftentimes, teams might want to record many behaviors in this section. If you have many behaviors that could be listed, try to focus on the three that are the most disruptive or unsafe within the school building. Try to reduce more than three behaviors at a time can quickly become frustrating and unproductive. Lastly, in this section, estimate the frequency of the behavior. If you have done your homework and have information available from a scatter plot, enter that information here. If you have not completed a scatter plot, estimate the frequency of the behavior and consider implementing a scatter plot or similar data collection tool. In the third section, we consider triggers and antecedents, or more simply stated, what happens before the problem behavior is displayed. When looking at what typically occurs before a behavior occurs, consider specific demands or situations. This student appears to demonstrate the inappropriate behaviors around 10 a.m. and 1 p.m., just before independent work periods. This team also did a good job of recording specific demands, such as the 10 a.m. time being used for independent reading time and the 1 p.m. time being used for independent math work. 
We will also want to answer where the behavior is most likely to occur, such as the classroom, office, or other areas in the building. Setting events, including descriptions of the environment, such as who is in the room, noise levels, materials being used, and whether this behavior occurs in all situations. Lastly, it can be helpful to identify any health or medication issues. In the consequences section, we want to view factors that happen after the problem behavior is displayed, not just punishments and penalties that staff may apply. This team has described teacher reaction, student reaction, Rick's classmates' reactions, and whether or not the original task was completed. Next, we want to identify a function for the student's behavior. According to Sattler and Hogue in their text, Assessment of Children, we can look at two main functions. One, to get something, such as attention and tangible objects. Or two, to escape or avoid something, such as an undesired person or activity. Some of the more behaviorally specific functions listed on the functional assessment form include peer attention, adult attention, obtain items, avoid peers, power and control, avoid adults, and avoid tasks or activities. Your team should attempt to come to a conclusion as a group about which function the behavior is serving. It should be noted that a box is listed for teams that don't know. If this is the case, you will want to consult with your school social worker, school psychologist, or a behavior specialist. After a function is identified, try to explain the function as specifically as possible to the student you are working with. Our example student appears to be displaying the problem behaviors since the function that is driving those behaviors is to avoid independent work assignments. Even more specifically, this team noted that this example student is struggling to meet benchmark scores related to reading proficiency. The next section discusses current plans and strategies in place. The team and parent, if involved, should attempt to list current strategies that are being utilized to help in reducing the problem behaviors. Occasionally, schools have a hard time listing specific strategies that are being used. This should not be viewed as a deficit. This is an opportunity to strengthen function-based strategies when we move into writing the behavior intervention plan. The student input section can be one of the most helpful sections available. However, teams often forget to interview or talk with the student regarding behavioral difficulties. Be sure to note whether or not the student was interviewed, and if so, what was discussed in relation to the problem behavior? Statements such as, my work makes me mad, can provide valuable insights into student behavior and the function driving that behavior. In the section labeled Other, be sure to look at the student's current strengths and motivators that can be built into his or her behavior intervention plan. It is also important to consider what replacement behavior you will focus on teaching this student. If a student is leaving the room or throwing supplies out of frustration, think about what you would rather have them do. Examples include appropriately asking for help or accessing a break area when frustrated. Occasionally teams want to list replacement behaviors such as work quietly or follow all adult requests. While these can be good goals to work towards, some students will need to take smaller steps to reach these goals. Consider the individual needs of your student when considering a replacement behavior. The most important thing to remember is this. If you're taking away a problematic behavior, you will need to replace it with an appropriate behavior. In the summary or hypothesis section, your team will need to come to a conclusion regarding the target behavior and the function that it plays for the student. This statement is the summary of the functional assessment since you will notice you are filling in the antecedent trigger, concurrent condition, target behavior, and function, all sections that you have previously completed. Our example reads, the available information suggests that when our student is required to engage in independent work times in conjunction with perceiving that the work is difficult, the child runs from the classroom 
or crawls under his desk in order to escape or avoid the independent work time. Hopefully it is clear that by having a hypothesis or summary statement, you will begin to focus your attention on how we can teach the student to obtain this function in an appropriate way. In our example, the team believes that frustration is driving the behavior of avoidance. By organizing our assessment in this way, we can apply interventions targeted at reducing avoidant behaviors. These interventions may be both academic and behavioral in nature. It should also be noted that often teams don't get the function right on the first try. After all, behavior is not an exact science. You will know if you're on the right track by examining your data in the days and weeks to come. If your team is on the right track and applying interventions with fidelity, you should expect the behavior to begin decreasing. If it does not, you may consider updating or completing a new functional behavior assessment. Questions and requests for additional supports can be made to Joe Zima, Behavior Specialist for St. Clair County RESA, by phone at 810-455-4045 or by email at zima.joe at sccresa.org.